Good morning from beautiful Brisbane, Australia. How are you this morning? It's Friday. Yay. And we've had the most incredible two days. This is going into our third. Talking about how complex trauma, at, well, complex PTSD, is impacting our lives from an abandonment perspective and how that begins to happen. So we've looked at minimization, we've looked at denial, we've looked at uh, verbal and physical, verbal and emotional abuse. And today we're going to look at how the inner critic develops, but I'm really excited because I'm able to bring to you the reverse of how the inner critic develops in order that we have a step-by-step -step process that we can begin to look at and examine ourselves internally and know whereabouts we're going or what's the one next thing that we can look at, uh, self-reflect on and so much more. So good morning, my name's Linda and welcome to the Academy for Complex Trauma and welcome to our Friday session. And we're going through a little bit at a time, Complex PTSD by Pete Walker, lovely guy, answers all his emails. And this book will never let you down, <laughs> okay? It's brilliant. When I first read it, it was like going, oh, thank goodness, somebody finally understands what's happening internally for me. And that's what we need so much, the language. And good morning, girls. It's great to have you here. So what I'm going to do this morning too is I will put what I'm reading from up on the screen. You may not be able to read it, especially if you're on a phone. But what I will do later on, well, after the broadcast, is put together a blog post. And then you're going to be able to see quite clearly how the inner critic develops. And then you'll have a sheet which puts everything in reverse so that you can begin to unpack and see and experience what's happening internally for you with each step and get a good idea of different parts of the recovery process with the inner critic. Okay, so let me just grab sheet one for you, which, like I said, I'm sorry it's so small, but I had to fit in as much as I could. <laughs> so that when I give them to you in the blog post, you're going to be able to go right. And you will be able to print them off from the blog post so that you can either sit and journal with them or have them on the fridge, reflect on them, but so that you'll have the information in front of you and then you'll be able to go right. This is what I need to work on now. This is what I need to self-reflect on or I need to work on building an awareness internally of what's happening for me. Okay, good morning, everyone. It's great to have you here. So for those that have just joined in, we've looked at the first two days. We looked at denial and minimization. Then we've looked at verbal and emotional abuse and neglect in the family. And now we're going to bring it all together and go through how our inner critic develops. Now, our inner critic is that voice in our head or our mind where we're always giving ourselves a hard time and we're giving ourselves a harder time than anybody else will ever give us. Okay, everyone stick your hands up because you just know that it's the truth. And so I want you to be able, to, even though it's on the screen, I'm sorry if you can't read it if you're on a phone, um, but like I said, I will have these in a link down below uh, after the broadcast so that you can jump onto the link and print them out or screenshot them, copy them, save them on your phone so that you can remember what you need to reflect on. Okay, so we all get put into our family of origin or our caretakers. It depends on how life unfolds for us in the beginning. And the adults in our home environment, maybe physically, verbally, emotionally, sexually, mentally abusive slash neglectful, and it comes in all varieties, as we know. Um, throughout the early stages of our life, uh, through our home life, 
we face unrelenting criticism where there's parental rage, uh, scorn, disdain, all of which are internalised by the child, by us, and this changes the structure of our brain. Now, I want you also to be aware of the nonverbal ways that this happens as well. So remember, when you walk into a room, you can automatically sense when somebody's angry or upset or you walk in and they're happy and you just know, all right? So that's the nonverbal language that we emit. Now, in our home life, we can have experienced all of these things non-verbally as well, although I've yet to meet an angry person who, who didn't at some point explode, but you know that they're angry. And when we're kids, we've got no way of putting language around that at all. It's like, you know, we're in a space where we're supposed to be loved, supported, nurtured, cared for, um, and shown love. So all of this stuff that goes on goes against what we're wired for to develop into good, healthy, whole human beings, okay? So when this goes on repeatedly over the years, um, it becomes a, we adopt it, okay? We endlessly repeat the words, the attitudes, the nonverbal stuff. We internalise it all. And it creates thick neural pathways, okay? And these thick neural pathways are of self-hate and self-disgust. When I sat here reading this last night, I was like, my goodness, we're children and because of what happens in our environment, we learn self-hate and self-disgust. And it was pretty tender to think about it because it's like, wow, I have to be willing to own if I'm still at that space where I have self-disgust or I have self-hate. And it's not the mask that we put on. So I don't, <laughs> fortunately, I don't run around with a mask these days, but I used to, absolutely used to until I did, um, I did plenty of years of the course, My Authentic Self. But we definitely go deeper and deeper into this stuff. So it's not a case of, oh, well, yeah, you know, that's not me. It's not happening. I don't have self-hate. I don't have self-disgust. It's, hmm, let me sit down and feel in my heart for a while. Is that happening for me? So anybody who answers you pretty quickly about that, you really want to know, have they delved deeper? All right, we want to know and we want to be able to reflect are we carrying it from when we were children? And the only person we have to be authentic, truthful with is ourself. Okay, but meanwhile, you get to hear me ramble on about it too because it's very real. I mean, I used to think, why are you telling me to love myself? If I didn't love myself, I would have killed myself. I'm, no offense meant at all. But that's how my thought process was because I had to stay alive. You know, there wasn't an option to opt out for me. It's very personal, I know. And I, one of my children um, battles suicidal ideation every day. So I am aware how heavy that is and I'm not taking it lightly. But we want to know, we want to be able to ask ourselves some pretty full-on questions so that we know that we're getting rid of what was programmed into us, okay? So after we've got the self-hate and self-disgust happening, um, you know, we thicken neural pathways, our thoughts, feelings and behaviours over time reflect this internal dialogue, all right? So we've got this internal dialogue going on repeatedly we don't know it and it affects our neurology so over time when we as a child we try to be vulnerable or authentic internal networks of self-loathing are activated so what that means is if I try and connect with somebody as a child I try and have that relationship 
or I try and be social because we miss out on all the social, um, learning the social cues, learning all about how to so be socialised. It just isn't there for a lot of us. And that's because of everything that happens in the brain. So the child then hates themselves for trying to connect and communicate because it doesn't work with these adults. Okay, so that's in childhood. So then we go into adulthood. So program that for years. We go into adulthood and unconsciously our actions are, well, why bother trying to connect? It never works out. Uh it doesn't happen for me. I don't understand why I can't make friends. And there's a whole list of stuff that goes on trying to cover the fact that we felt exposed when we tried to be vulnerable and connect and communicate with other people. Uh, I know for me, so as an, and this is, this is the really hard part. As an adult, I was happy to talk to people, um, <laughs> I've never forgotten my mind. One of my first jobs, I was very quiet, shy, and I'd just sit at my desk and eat lunch. And then I looked up one day and there's all these women just that pulled their chairs up and they're sitting around my desk and I was like, what's going on? So I've always had um, the ability to be kind and caring and that attracts people, but internally it would terrify me. It absolutely terrified me because I didn't know what to do. How do I manage this? What am I supposed to say? And I would sit there and, and just listen. So <laughs> I developed very good listening skills. And you've probably found the same as well. Because if there's one thing we come out of our childhood with is this amazing capacity to love unconditionally. And we do. We just love. And when just as a side note when it comes to relationships we have to be aware of our ability to just love so it's not full on it's just so completely love and accept people that we have to be aware that not everybody's like us and we have to dial it back and learn to recognize if people are safe or unsafe do they respect boundaries or don't they respect boundaries? And all of this comes about because of what happened in our childhood. So because we don't feel comfortable to be vulnerable, to connect and communicate, we begin to self-abandon, okay? So the, and we no longer have the ability to support ourselves or take that, take our own side. Um, it's just all gone. Okay, and this is all in the development of the inner critic. Okay, so the neural pathways expand into a large complex network that becomes the inner critic. All right, how complex is all of this? But there's good news. Okay, this is. We're at the end of how it develops. So the inner critic negative perspectives create many programs of self-rejecting, of perfectionism. We obsess about danger and catastrophize incessantly. When I read that, I thought, mm, I don't know that I did that. But what I, how it came out in me was is that I'm always thinking five, ten steps ahead of what's going to happen, especially when I had kids, young little kids. It's like, what do we need? Where are we going? What are we going to need at that stage? And on and on and on. And there was no ability to relax, definitely. So we might read that and think, oh, I don't do that, but I want you to trust the science, that it's there in us, but how it presents will be different for each of us. So I've learned to take the language and then examine it and say, well, how does that appear in my life? Oh, and if anyone was a perfectionist, I've got to stick my hand up definitely for that. I've, and I still like to do my work perfectly, but I don't obsess over it anymore. It can be just right, and that's okay. 
Uh, one of the things that comes with it all is inflexible thinking. So when I found that out, I went, I don't have inflexible thinking. I'm, you know, I get along with everyone, blah, blah. And then when I began to sit back and really think about it, this is what I mean. This isn't just, oh, yeah, no, yeah, no. This is deep internal stuff. I went, hmm. When it comes to th certain things, I have been inflexible. And when I can see something in a bigger picture or another door through to another area of solving a problem, I have been inflexible because I, I know I used to say to the kids, Dad, can't you see that this is what's going to happen? And this unfolds because we're always looking X amount of steps ahead. So inflexible thinking doesn't mean that we're like cut and dried, you know, I would call it because I have Asperger's, Asperger's thinking where we're just so totally focused. Inflexible thinking is it's my way because I can see this and your way it's not. Rather than sitting down and being vulnerable, communicating, connecting and working out how we can do it together. Okay, so... <laughs> It's not easy, but it's doable. Okay, so all of this has happened and then we live in varying degrees of emotional flashbacks, okay? Um, and then when you look at inflexible thinking, look at is it all or none? Is it all one way or not at all? I know in, in my younger years I was definitely it's all one way or not at all. And now I try and dial it back to, okay, what do I need to do in this situation? How can I communicate that? And where can I go from here to make it even for everybody? Okay. Uh, and all of this develops in us an unhealthy ego. And we need a healthy ego. Otherwise, we, we don't do things like stand up for ourselves and we keep going into bad relationships and not being able to stand up for ourselves when things go wrong. So we gloss over it. And we can't do that because we, well, if you're like me, you end up in unsafe situations and uh, that are very unhealthy and distressing. So this is a quote from the book by Pete Walker. And it really, really reflected what's happening here. So the verbal and emotional layer of the abuse onion, so think of the onion, peel, 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 all bits in between, has many sub-layers of minimization. I've heard clients jokingly repeat numerous versions of this over and over. I know I'm hard on myself, but if I don't constantly kick my own ass, I'll be more of a loser than I already am. In fact, I really need you to come down on me if I try to get away with anything. When I read that, I just went, I know I've said a variation of those words in my life. Listen, if I'm not getting it right, can you tell me? Oh, we, we just, it's such a stressful way to live. A childhood rife with verbal and emotional abuse forces a child to so thoroughly identify with the critic that it is as if the critic is his whole identity. And this is why we need this information because we need to know if our identity is wrapped up in that inner critic or can I answer, answer the question, who am I in my authentic self? in order that I can look at these different parts and go, well, that doesn't resemble who I am. So I'm not, not going to do that anymore. And I'm going to have strategies to make sure I don't do that anymore. Okay. So here's the good bit. I reversed everything into a list so that we can have a list of how to develop a healthy ego and get rid of this inner critic. Okay. Pardon me. We don't need it anymore, but it does take work and takes time. I think I just put up number one again. I did. Sorry about that, girls. Let me, let me get the right one. Here we go. Right. 
So we want to develop a healthy ego. Now, healthy ego, we always think that ego is a bad thing because we always imagine somebody who walks around full of themselves. Um, you don't have to tell me how good I am. I can tell you how good I am. All right, that's unhealthy. All right, people that walk around like that are unhealthy. They've got wounds as well. A healthy ego means that I'm going to be able to stand up for myself. I'm going to be able to be vulnerable. I can communicate. I'm going to be able to say what I need, what I mean, and I'm going to be able to have adult conversations and adult relationships, even if it's messy and we, we have to go back and forth like a tennis match to work out what each other needs. We're going to do it. So that's the sign of a healthy ego. Like one of my clients came in and, you know, they're working through not getting into the same type of relationship. And we were going through this information because they need to be able to say, no, thank you. They don't want to go down the same path with somebody else again. And that requires us to have a healthy ego. So what are the first things we're going to do? We're going to consciously listen to our spoken words, our thoughts, our feeling and feel our emotions. Okay. So we're going to become aware of things like, uh, well, the inner critic, all those things. Does what I'm saying, thinking or feeling reflect all those other things that made up the inner critic? So I'm going to recognize if I have inflexible thinking. All right. I'm going to recognize when I have a negative perspective. Um, our self-rejecting perfectionism is in play. I'm going to recognize it and I'm going to develop strategies not to have to have everything perfect or expect every, everyone else to be my version of perfect. And I'm still working on that at a mind level as well in regards to other people. And it comes down to a safety factor. I need to know I'm safe. So that's we revisit it when diff, as we heal and grow. We have to be willing to revisit different parts of this. Um, then we're going to go into recognition of times when we abandon ourselves, don't support ourselves, and don't take our own side. So we don't when we don't stand up for ourselves and we don't say our point of view, our perspective. Um, how can we work it through as adults and so on? And it does take time to practice this. Um, I'm fortunate my kids are adults. So I practice with them and with my friends all the time. And it's great. It's good to work through it and know when you're developing that healthy ego and standing up and saying, well, no, that's not for me, <laughs> instead of hiding behind closed closed doors, closed windows and turning the phone off. I, I'm not kidding. Sometimes I've had to do that in the past because it all just got too much. But I even took myself off out to see a girlfriend, just rang her and said, I'm on my way the other day. And I went, oh, this is so good. Life's getting better all the time. Okay. We need to learn to feel safe to connect and communicate with other significant adults. Learning to feel safe to connect. Oh, I wrote that twice. I'll fix that. Learning how to be safe to feel and communicate vulnerability and be our authentic self. Uh, monitoring our internal dialogue, okay? Continually reducing our identification with the inner critic. So,